Our presenter today is a board certified neurosurgeon. Doesn't look like one to me, but certainly she specializes in multidisciplinary care yeah. for patients with brain disorders, including movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, dystonia, and essential tremor. Uh, she and her team have performed nearly 400 MRI procedures for Parkinson's disease and similar disorders using the ClearPoint Neuro Platform. And I believe that's the organization that you're with, mm -hmm. ClearPoint. Yep, that's correct. She is one of the most experienced and proficient users of this technology in the United States today, particularly regarding DBS and pallidotomy, both very common procedures for people with Parkinson's. She will discuss both awake and sleep DBS surgical options and shine some light on some other DBS topics as well. Uh, she and her associate have come a long way to be with us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jessica Wilden and her associate, Lena Hernandez. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, guys. Um, as Lena could probably tell Vince and everybody else, I'm probably gonna just go totally off the rails here and talk to you about some stuff that really doesn't have anything to do with business or new technology. Um, a little bit more about my background is that I graduated uh, UCSF as a fellow in California. And at the time I had wanted uh, basically to go to a place where it was largely underserved. So a place where maybe when you had Parkinson's, you were told, well, just go die. There's nothing that can be done. And America is great and competition is great and our society is great. But there are big parts of this country where you would be shocked at the lack of care for things that have an option. And so I actually started a practice in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, about a decade ago, serving an area called the Arc Latex. And it was sort of the northern corner of Louisiana, uh, eastern rural Texas, and rural southern Arkansas. And at the time, the options there for Parkinson's were non-existent. Like, you didn't have any movement disorder, neurologist. You didn't have any Parkinson's surgery, that's for darn sure. And you really didn't have many therapy options. And so part of what my team and I did in Shreveport with the help of ClearPoint uh, and Boston Scientific and many other companies that were invested in trying to bring something to that area, we created a multidisciplinary clinic in Shreveport where we offered medical management, where we offered physical therapy, where we offered palliative care, where we offered surgery. And it was a unique position to be in as a neurosurgeon because in a lot of places, I would simply have been an operator, right? Just a technician and like, hey, good to see ya. I'll probably never see you again once your wounds heal. It wasn't like that in Shreveport. I had to manage everybody. I had to pick them. I had to operate and I had to manage them forever <laughs> because there wasn't really anyone else in the area. And, uh, and we had a delightful, just real shout out here for American business, um, a very delightful CEO named Jim Elrod, uh, who ran Willis Knighton Health System in that area until he retired this year, really supported the clinic, even though financially it was maybe not a huge moneymaker. And just again, another really great example of, you know, American business can make a really big impact to a community. And he certainly did. And so for about a decade, we sustained that effort in Shreveport and the Arc Tech, And it gave me a lot of insights into, <laughs> I guess what I would call some common misconceptions. Surgeons tend to believe what they're told because it's like the military, right? We're not questioning a lot of stuff. Oh, DBS works every time. Oh, DBS make you 100% better. And what I discovered when I was not just operating, but then I was having to bring people back into the fold and kind of manage their ups and their downs and figure out how to get the device to work for them. It's not as clear cut at all. And so out of curiosity, I know a gentleman back, who here has DBS? Okay, there's one guy. So yeah, you're the one that basically can say yay or nay on some of this. But I think that, are there are still a lot of growth 
that we need to do about understanding your disease. How many times have you been told, oh, that medicine doesn't do that, or that symptom isn't Parkinson's? Like, how the hell do we know, right? Like, we don't know. I mean, all the drug studies are done on a very narrow portion of people. And so one of the things I used to tell my office was, no matter what a patient says, know that we don't know, right? That we know an average response to something, but your experience is real and you have no incentive to make stuff up to us you know so whatever it is you're experiencing is real and it is a part of parkinson's disease if that's the disease you have and i think moving forward with that philosophy in my practice over the last decade it really opened my eyes that there is a lot we still don't know um, not only about dbs but about medicine uh, about the right way to do therapy about how every individual Parkinson's patient will experience it differently. And so that's a little bit of my background and where I'm coming from, although I appreciate the wonderful introduction. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that there's a lot we don't know, not just about surgery, about your disease period. And you need to enter into a good relationship with your neurologist, with your surgeon, with your physical therapist, because you guys together will be learning how you experience the disease together and what the best ways are to deal with that. And so there's not just one right technology. There's not just one right surgery. There's not one right approach, period. It's not that, oh, you need medicine and then you need surgery or, oh, you need physical therapy. Every approach for every patient will be a little different. And it's important to keep an open mind about all the different options because the disease is so terribly heterogeneous. Everyone experiences it differently. So with that being said, we'll get a little bit more into some basics. Obviously everyone kind of knows what Parkinson's is, but I think one of the things that's important to realize is that Parkinson's can occur in anyone. Um, a good example I give is I got a young person who was in and out of jail um, and someone at the church had told his mom, you know, bring him in to see me. And he came in, he was about 37, 35, something like this. He'd been aggressive in and out of jail. And the minute he walked in, I was like, this guy's got Parkinson's, you know, it was as obvious as all get out. And he had had symptoms since he was probably about 21 or 22 in terms of his foot turning in. And what was happening was he was buying Mirapex, right? The medicine for Parkinson's on the street because he just knew he felt better when he took it, right? And that led to all sorts of trouble because it was drug abuse and all these things. And so we just, we diagnosed him, we treated him and he ended up living a very good life. He didn't even need surgery. He just needed some cinema, some PT. But, you know, I think that he had seen a bajillion doctors, right? But the idea was, oh, Parkinson's only happens in elderly or Parkinson's only happens in this type of demographic. And that's simply not true. Parkinson's can occur in any age. Um, it can be juvenile as well in certain families. Um, any gender, women, oh my goodness. I cannot tell you the amount of women that would come to my clinic, fibromyalgia, fatigue, you're stressed, you're anxious, and would have very clear Parkinson's symptoms. And so I think women in particular need to be very aggressive about saying, no, I'm not just stressed. Something is distinctly wrong here. Um, women got blown off a lot in the region I was at. And so um, race, right? Black people get Parkinson's too. They're not that visible, um, but you know, in our articles and everything, but it's important to realize anyone can get Parkinson's. It is generally more common in older than younger people. It's also more common in men than women, but still happens in women. Your average age is probably about 60, but you can get it, like the story I told, in somebody younger than 50, and that is termed young onset Parkinson's disease. And the course of Parkinson's in an older versus a younger person can be a little bit different. So you do need to kind of tailor your approach depending. Um, so why does Parkinson's happen? Well, I think most of you probably know it's due to a loss of dopamine. So you can think of dopamine sort of being passed between the brain cells to make sure everything is functioning smoothly. 
So you, I like to think of dopamine like oil in a machine, right? You oil up your farm machinery or whatnot, and it runs smoothly. Then when the oil runs out, it starts to not work as well. So when dopamine is low in the brain, the brain signaling, the machinery of the brain gets not quite right. And it starts to creak and not communicate well. And so the dopamine cells generally die off in a structure called the substantia nigra. And we don't know why they die off, but it's probably a lot of different reasons combined. So this is like a pictorial example. You can see on the top there, that sort of uh, orangish structure, right? This is where the dopamine cells live in here. And this is like a normal, you know, your dopamine between the cells, like oil in a machine, it's flowing. The machine is communicating good, like no problems. You can see in Parkinson's, this loses its nice healthy color and you don't have as much oil or dopamine going across the cells and the communication starts to creak and not work quite well. And the reason I like to get into kind of why this happens is because I think that a lot of people have difficulty expressing the problem in Parkinson's sometimes. Like it's not like stroke, right? You're not weak per se, but it's almost like it's a communications problem. <laughs> And that can be a very difficult thing to figure out. So I like this slide. We'll just skip ahead really quick. It's poor communication going on in the brain. So because of that, it leads to abnormal movement. So kind of like your planning area of the brain, the big boss is not communicating well with the motor area, which is like middle management which is then not sending the correct signal to your muscles, which are like your frontline workers. So, but I find that that process can be really hard to explain to an outsider, right? You, you, it comes off as I am telling myself to move or to do something and it's not happening. <laughs> and I think because of that, a lot of times, especially if your visit's very quick, that it can be hard to really express how much you're suffering to a doctor or a nurse because it's such a hard thing to explain. Okay. But that that's kind of the issue. But, and then a lot of Parkinson's patients think, Oh man, I'm just crazy. You're not crazy. Okay. It's a communications problem between different areas of the brain to the muscles. So it's not as straightforward as stroke, but it's not all in your head either. It's sort of a middle ground where the communication is not right. And when you tell your body to do something in a coordinated fashion, it just has difficulty doing it. But then some days, right, for whatever reason, a little extra oil comes out and you're able to do it. But then people might get frustrated, like, why are you doing it now? And you didn't do it yesterday, right? And I think it's just important to understand that the brain is very complicated. Parkinson's is very complicated. Some of your days will be good and communication will happen even with low dopamine and other days it will be terrible. It doesn't mean that you're being difficult or you're faking it. It means that the brain is complicated. And that's why I think another issue with misunderstanding Parkinson's is why do you have good and bad days? Like if you were really sick, all your days would be bad. It's not like that. The brain state changes with the weather with emotion, with viral illness. So the experience of Parkinson's can be different every single day. And I think that's part of where people get frustrated with the disease and with surgery as well. So backing up, why does dopamine die off and go away? Why does the oil dry up in Parkinson's disease? Well, bottom line, there are many pieces to the puzzle about why people get Parkinson's disease and scientists all over the world are working to figure them out, but we don't know. Uh, we know that certain exposures can predispose you to developing uh, dopamine cell death. Certainly things like dry cleaning chemicals, uh, paraquat, um, manganese. So heavy chemical exposure uh, in certain individuals can lead to Parkinson's. So in my clinic, I used to just tell younger people who maybe had parents who had Parkinson's, 
I would try and reduce your exposure to those things, you know, because it's a combination of your genetic makeup and your exposure. Not all people that have exposure to chemicals get Parkinson's, but we do know that having heavy exposure to chemicals in the right person can perpetuate Parkinson's disease. Um, an area where I would see this a fair amount was near Ashtown, Arkansas, where they did a lot of the forestry. For those of you that may have served in war, what is the chemical, right, that they use to get rid of the leaves on the trees? Agent Orange, right, 2,4-D. So um, because that's still used a fair amount in Arkansas to get rid of the leaves on the trees uh, for the forestry industry, I would see a fair amount of young men uh, from that area coming with early symptoms of some Parkinson's. So, you know, we do know that there are factors like exposure uh, in combination with your genetics, but it's a messy story uh, because it's the brain and it's really complicated <laughs> and we're, we're working on it, but it's not all sorted out yet. And so getting into why surgery works, well, when dopamine gets low, the communication gets bad. What does that mean? I like to think of it as bad brain rhythms occur, things that aren't smooth, that aren't coherent. So basically you can think of it as kind of a machine jerking and not having a regular rhythm. Or alternatively, you can think of bad brain rhythms in being like the heart, right? So just like you can get the AFib, or a bad heart rhythm, Parkinson's, essential tremor, and other diseases like that are essentially bad brain rhythms. And that paved the way, that basic understanding paved the way for an idea. Could a pacemaker be helpful for a bad brain rhythm? In a similar way, a pacemaker is helpful for a bad heart rhythm. So this was kind of a breakthrough in the late 80s and early 90s that Parkinson's was associated with a bad brain rhythm. And, um, and that really, that epiphany kind of paved the way for the idea to be able to use a pacemaker for Parkinson's. So what is the pacemaker? It's commercial name that most people know as deep brain stimulation, okay? Um, it is companies that provide the hardware. Boston Scientific is one, Abbott St. Jude is another, and the original pioneer of DBS is Medtronic. Um, Medtronic, you know, people have differing views on them. They did an amazing job in the late 80s and early 90s pioneering with Dr. Benabit in France to create the first version of commercial pacemaker. And so that was good. What wasn't good was what you know Vince alluded to was there was no competition for Medtronic for many years. And because it wasn't a particularly lucrative area, unlike the cardiac area, it really kind of stagnated. There was not a lot of research and development in deep brain stimulation until probably the last like five to 10 years. And I think that, so Medtronic does, get props for basically being the first to pioneer a deep brain stimulator commercially, but it really allowed the field to kind of stagnate until some of the other companies came on, provided some competition. And then in the last five years or so, there's just been a deluge of like new inventions and stuff coming out. So it's a good time right now to be in the market for a brain pacemaker because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with that. Um, so the DBS device, it is fully implanted. It can be placed all at once or piecemeal. That depends on some factors we can get into later. Um, and what happens is you get small regular pulses of electricity. You can't typically feel them, okay? They're just happening in the background. And you deliver little pulses of electricity to a certain network that's not working quite right and symptoms get better. So DBS does not involve more medicine. It is not a medical therapy. It doesn't involve a pump or an infusion or anything like that. And sometimes you're able to reduce your medicine. Not always, but sometimes. And I'm gonna explain in a slide down the road why there's kind of an evolution in how it's being done. Yeah. 
So this is the original design. So you can see here that you wear a metal head frame and it attaches to an OR table. And what was typically done when we first started looking at using the brain pacemaker in the 90s and early 2000s, the reality was we didn't know exactly where we wanted to be, right? We were still kind of sorting that out early on. And so we wanted to keep people awake so that we could test them, make sure they were getting the benefit that you wanted them to get because it was still kind of an early evolving field. And the technology was not there in the 90s. Remember, even at that time, MRI of the brain was kind of new and up and coming from the 80s into the 90s. So your imaging wasn't super great. So it made sense to keep patient awake for surgery and test them so that you knew you were going to get good results down the road. Okay. And in a lot of places, that's still the way it's done. And that's totally fine. Hey, if you can handle awake surgery, good for you. Um, <laughs> we'll get into if that's not your thing in a minute. But uh, this is still, I will give total credit. This, that is called a Lexcel frame. I, it was invented by Lars Lexcel uh, in Europe in like the 1950s. It is still in use today. I mean, it's just a tremendous invention. You know, you think of the longevity, right? Like the longevity of our phones, right? Like, oh, new year, got to get a new phone. You know, this technology turning over pretty quick. The Lexcel frame and similar frames have had such a long success story. Uh, they really are a quite amazing invention. And they've allowed hundreds of millions of people to be treated with the brain pacemaker. So that being said, Maybe it's not for everyone anymore <laughs> because maybe you're really anxious thinking about having to wear that. And so, you know, over since about mid 2000s, 2006, 2007, we've found um, should we offer the brain pacemaker maybe with a couple of different methods, right? Just in case maybe you're not appropriate for this traditional method. But like I look at DBS, like, you know, uh, like me and my dad look at church. Okay. Uh, we're Catholic and I, I like, you know, some maybe modern Catholic, you know, modern church, maybe, uh, some big white gospel choir, something a little avant-garde. Like, I like that kind of thing. Uh, my dad likes the traditional church, you know, very Gothic stained glass Latin if they have it's available. So, and that's just like DBS, right? You can have a very traditional surgery and do great with it and love it, but maybe that's not for you. And are there some other thing now you to do it a, a different way, fortunately. So let's go this. Now that's me on the, <laughs> I thought this was a video, I was sure. <laughs> That is me doing MRI surgery. So this is ClearPoint Neuro. ClearPoint Neuro is a right. A lot of hospitals have easier access to CT than MRI. Or alternatively, maybe your hospital has an intraop MRI. Some CEO purchased it, not totally sure how they were going to use it. And now they really want everything to be done in MRI and nothing to be done in the CT area. So it just kind of depends on your resources, right? Um, and your city and, and what environment you're in. But frameless DBS using essentially a plastic disposable frame under general anesthesia can be done with MRI or CT. ClearPoint uses MRI and that was my setup in Louisiana. And as you can see, it's a little different right? It's, um, you're totally asleep, obviously. And what we do is we use imaging instead of patient testing. So let's get into why it was possible to do something a different way as the technology got better. So just a quick, you know, reminder. So this is the ClearPoint smart frame. It is considered a type of frameless DBS. Um, Starfix, what you'll hear about next month, is another type of this. And essentially, that center cannula will end up pointing the brain lead to where it needs to go instead of the big frame and arc that you saw before. It's just another option. 
So this is a great slide to kind of understand the evolution of why this is happening. So back in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and even early 2000s, MRI technology is very mathematical and it's very programming heavy. And MRI technology was not at the point yet where it could really show us the structures that we wanted to hit very well, okay? So what we did instead is we co-opted an old research tool, which specifically is called microelectrode recording. And way in like these 40, 50, you listened for the brain signals and different structures had different sounds because we had no eyes, right? Or the eyes, what we could see on imaging was still very crude uh, at turn of the century and even into the 80s and 90s. So what we did instead with the patient awake, one, we kept the patient awake so we could test them. And two, we would listen for the structure because the technology simply wasn't there to see it yet. Does that make sense? There you go, it's following. So, um, play this. I have this is going to play on this laptop. Yes. So do you guys hear that? So that's an example of a Parkinson's structure called the STN. It's two dirt units firing one after another. Train here, you know. That's an example, right, of um, that's an example of listening for the stir. And that is the way we used to do it because image was not where it needed to be to see the structure. Okay, so now on this side, you're gonna see an example of the image today and how I would plan in the MRI. The imaging can actually now create a 3D stir, not from an atlas, not from a map, your brain image itself and shift it. Act, I'm trying to act. Because this imaging is so advanced now, I didn't really feel the need in Shreveport to keep you awake because I had so much better imaging. And it's just that the technology got better, right? And so I, you know, that is part of the reason I speak uh, for ClearPoint because a lot of people are still skeptical as you know like latin church but i was in a situation in shreveport where the education and the people simply were not a level where they, they could be awake right so we moved to imaging based cbs um it wasn't accepted technique but then we went on of the big series of it uh we implanted over 450 deep brain stimulator leads using this technique and what was special about that practice was that I followed most of them. So I wasn't trusting some neurologist to be like, yeah, or nay, you know, or yeah, oh yeah, they're fine. I saw them and I spoke to them and I asked, is this image based stuff? Is this a good result for you? Is this working for you? And the answer across the board was, yeah. In fact, it seemed like maybe it was working even a little better than awake surgery. <laughs> So it's not that one but the other, it's on your local resources, but now the image is enough for another option. We no longer have to listen for the signals. We can actually see the structure and the track instead of just hearing them. So it's just, you know, again, like my father and I in church, not better, just different. It just depends on what, where you want to travel for treatment and what your personal feel is. Maybe you want to be a part of your surgery you want to be awake you want to be tested and good you know that's those are good times you know we put the lead in and your tremor dots and you know that that's a great method too but but maybe you coming off your medicine maybe when they tell you i got to come off my medicine at midnight and i won't start it again until three hours later and that just totally gives you a panic attack and you're like oh no i'm not doing dbs because because can't be off my message in like 90 minutes before I start freaking out, you know? Like if you're one of those people and they're a little bit like that anxiety gets really bad when you come off dopamine, 
then this is a good method because you don't have to come off your medicine and you don't have to be awake. So I think it's the concept of what I call equity, right? We used to think fairness is given the same thing to everybody. No discrimination, you know, we just give the same thing to everybody. Basically is uh, what Clearpoint and to some degree what Starfix can do is that there are techniques that allow you to do it differently so I can meet each patient where they, where they are at. Because I think we're getting to a point in healthcare and in American society in general where fairness is not giving everyone the same thing. Fairness is giving everyone what they need to be able to get to where they want to be with their disease. And I think that that personally is why I like ClearPoint. Um, well, no, I just wanted to make sure I didn't like, it's not up. Any questions so far about that? I know I'm covering some pretty technical stuff, but I'm trying to, to make it so everyone can kind of follow what I'm saying here. Uh, if you have a question, just shout it out or raise your hand if you're hypophonic and I can come to you and, uh, and hear it because I know some people have a hard time. Uh, yeah. Do you want to give her the microphone if she's got a question? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, that's right. You're a caregiver. My bad. How long does that surgery once they're under? How long does that take? Yeah, how long does it take? Great question. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. So the question is, how long does an MRI surgery take with ClearPoint? And it's a really great question. Um, there is a little bit of a learning curve for every surgery. So if you're the very first MRI patient at a center, it might take four to five and a half hours. At my center, by the end, if we were doing a single side, it would be about an hour and a half. Um, and if we were doing a double side, it would be about three hours. And most of that is scan time. And why is that, right? Because you're cutting out a lot of pieces, right? Patient testing, listening to the brain, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's, and this is another reason I opted for this method in Shreveport was that people were very sick. Um, a lot of heart disease, a lot of pollution, unfortunately. People were not very healthy. We started talking about doing surgery that was half a day or a whole day my population simply could not handle that. It was too um, high risk. So one of our goals with using MRI surgery was to compress the surgery down as fast as we could, because that, again, we were meeting people where they were. We weren't asking them, oh, you come to me. I'm the doctor. You come to where I'm at. We looked at a very sick population and said, we need to meet them where they are. Surgery needs to be shorter. The incision needs to be smaller. It needs to be more minimal. The blood loss needs to be things played in to the adoption of MRI surgery, which was helpful for that population. And I think it's helpful for subpopulations pretty much anywhere. And that's why it's good to have more than one way of doing things. So, this is just, this is a cheesy ClearPoint video. Totally not mine. I'm not taking credit here, but I'll just let you guys watch that while I take a minute. Can we turn this up a little, Elaine? With the MRI guided DVFC placement procedure, the patient is prepared for surgery, which may include local or general anesthesia. Never mind. <laughs> it's a special set of hardware and software that is combined with a series of MRI scans. So basically, they're just saying we use the MRI scan to predict your structure the brain. and your target. MRI scans are the only piece of cranial imaging without exposure to harmful radiation. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to go up and I don't think it worked, but. That's okay. That's okay. That's, we'll I'll just skip that. Bottom line, right? You're under anesthesia. We use MRI to show the target, which was the slide I just showed you. And, um, and you can find that corporate video on ClearPoint's website. <laughs> um, so what's the neurosurgeon's uh, perspective? Okay. Because one of the things I used to love about Louisiana was the state meeting. 
because I would go, you know, from Shreveport, which was seen as some like low level, crappy little place. And I would have to go to a conference with like these big famous guys from New Orleans. Okay. And there was one in particular, I will not name names, but every year he would be like, oh, Jessica, patients don't care about being awake. They don't care about wearing the frame. They love it. They love me. New Orleans is the best. And I would always just ask him, you know, oh, Dr. So-and-so, have you worn it? Have you done a mock case wearing the frame? And he'd be like, no, have you? I'm like, yeah, you bet, <laughs> right? I'm not gonna ask you to do something that I haven't done. And when I first came to Shreveport and I was playing around with the different methods I was gonna use, there had never been deep brain stimulation in that area, not for 25 years. So I wasn't gonna just bust out and do a case with a patient without testing it on somebody first, you know, at least going through the flow with the team and stuff. They'd never seen it before. So, you know, I, I thought about asking a student, you know, hey, can you wear the frame? But then I thought, no, that's, that's like kind of a jerk move. So, so I did it. I was the patient. And uh, this is a picture of that day. <laughs> you can tell I'm just super pumped about it. Uh, yeah, it, it's not for everyone. If you've been able to do it, great. But I will tell you, it was uncomfortable for me. And when I laid backwards, especially in like kind of the beach chair position in the OR, the darn things dug into the back of my skull. And I mean, I don't even have Parkinson's, right? I was pretty mobile, right? Yeah, this guy gets me. Yeah. So, I, you know, I just, I disagree with the idea that everything is good for everybody. You know, a lot of people, People are not into this and that are because I've done it. <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> and so a lot of CT coming up next month. You know, there are people that use CT. I'll know why I don't for that in a minute. But can you stay on your medicine? Your eye pictures to guide you through it now. And then, and, and my standpoint, I have followed all my own patients for so many years, uh, they did at least a well, um, lot better than what I had traditionally seen for a weight surgery. So what are the qualifications for DBS? Here's another kind of important Keep stimulating the work, use it correctly. And what do I mean by that? Not a last resort therapy. And it hasn't very long Stem cell, which was a team 15. DBS is trying to retrain your brain like a pacemaker to fire in a more effective, better way. So doing whatever it wants. The older of a dog you let it become, teaching it a new trick gets harder and harder. <laughs> so the current indications for DBS, and I would recommend patients all the time, consider adding it as a tool as soon as they met criteria. Parkinson's disease for four years and medical issues, meaning the fluctuations, dyskinesia, Michael J. Fox movements, residual tremor, um, medical medicine intolerance like nausea, any of those things for just 16 weeks. So if you have had a medicine side effect for four months and you've had Parkinson's symptoms for four years, you qualify for deep brain stimulation according to the FDA who is super stringent. So what I saw routinely in my practice was that people were referred like 10 or 15 years beyond that point. And the problem with that is that sure, it's still gonna work, but, but now your brain dog, it a little bit harder and teaching it a new trick is gonna be harder. <laughs> it is all about trying to retrain the brain. And the longer you let the brain go along a bad pathway or a bad firing pathway, the harder it is to get it back to something more normal. It gets into why it's a process. <laughs> So I think that, you know, you're going to get a lot of differing opinions about this. And I should say that everything I'm saying now, although ClearPoint did 
uh, put me out here uh, for teaching. These are my opinions. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Dr. Jessica Wilden, um, or email me at wildenmd at gmail. I'm happy to give you more information, but these are my opinions ultimately. I am promoting ClearPoint as a technology because I saw it help patients, but a lot of what I'm saying is on me, and these are just my experience over the years. What I would see, that being said, what I would see is that neurology would not send people for DBS very quickly because a lot of them did make money off drug trials. And you need to be aware of that. And it is your right to ask about that because drugs and pharmaceutical industry are very lucrative. And we had a very well-known person in Dallas where people would just be, they would have been ready to add the pacemaker for years. And yet they were held on to because they were part of these drug trials that were very lucrative. And so you need to watch out for stuff like that, that, you know, it may be well-meaning. The neurologist may think that you're in the right place for you, but only, you know, if you're thinking, I really want to learn more about this tool, it's absolutely your right to ask. And if they're like, oh no, you're too early. That's where it helps as a patient to know the criteria. You can be like, well, I had Parkinson's for four years and you know, I, I've had some breakthrough tremor or some fluctuations for a few months. And, and I think that that's the FDA criteria. You'll blow your neurologist away, but I guys can do it. We put it in pretty straightforward language. Um, you do need to be more proactive because what you're going to see out there is in a lot of places, people may not understand deep brain stimulation or may under, not understand the indication. And that is true even among doctors. So the patient really needs to kind of know what's up and take the initiative to say well, some of my medicine can are, but it always helps for you to also know what's going on, just so you can gauge what kind of options you're being offered. And if there's any bias that you think is coming through. Basically, if you have a frame, that's fine. You can just set, let's say you have a patient who wants clear point, you can just order what you need for that case because it's disposable. So, you know, the clear point can be added on to any practice that you're seeing. You just have to have the knowledge to mention it and bring it up. <laughs> so, and then clear point takes care of the rest. If a doctor is interested, then I work with them along with some others for teaching about the technique and, uh, and how to optimize the imaging and that kind of thing. So, you know, we definitely, um, we are expanding and I think it's a good thing. Cause like I said, I don't want to replace all other types of DBS. Some people love the Latin mass and that's totally fine. But let's say the frame is not for you. The older way is not for you and you want something faster or more convenient or more comfortable, then this is a nice add-on to any program out there that wants to kind of meet people where they're at. Yeah. Sure. No, shoot. Yeah. Yep. No, you can definitely do MRI based surgery. Oops, hang on. Sorry, technical problems. Yeah, I'm a technical genius. Just kidding. Um, so, yeah, great question. Um, you can, I believe, in a whole system, have MRI based surgery on the other side. And yeah, if your surgeon's a female, females tend to be a little more into uh, to new tech. So tell her to call me uh, because it sounds like a great thing to offer this crew. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it's just, it's a nice, it's nice because it's just another option in case you're not raring to do the frame again, <laughs> which I totally feel you because I don't even have Parkinson's and I wasn't raring to do it again. Um, yeah, right. It sucks. All that anesthesia. Yeah. Yeah, right. And that's a great point. You know, um, when you come off your medicine, sometimes it's just like tumbling down a hill, right? And then you're like crawling back up trying to get normalized again. And then, I mean, that's no small deal. Uh, for a lot of people coming off their medicine is, uh, is just not a viable option. And, um, you know, and then another really important thing, and this is, please email me if you have <laughs> more interest in, uh, in grassroots political activity. Um, why have we stuck with older methods for so long? Because the coding 
for government payment is higher? Am I not being offered what is best for me? <laughs> Understand that your government coding prioritizes and incentivizes the thing that is hardest for you. <laughs> we just want to let that settle there for a minute. <laughs> so Parkinson's bill is now being sponsored in Congress. And there are gentlemen that are sponsoring it. And I would encourage everybody to contact them and say, hey, I'm a part of this community. And I know that this coding is not in my benefit. I want it changed because one of their, one of their goals is how to increase access. We'll make it easier for everybody. That'll increase access. Easier for everybody. You cannot have it be that you are consistently losing money by doing what is most convenient for you. And so that coding needs to be modernized. And I think the Parkinson's bill uh, definitely is potentially a chance to at least outreach and talk about some of these things. But so you see that, yes, the technology, it has to do with technology, it has to do with money, right? I, that is unfortunately the other reality about America. Uh, despite a lot of the good things, a lot of things are very much driven by finances. So, but you know, that's why I tell you about it because you as the consumer will be the person who will make the biggest difference. So, so to come full circle, right? What happened to my clinic? What do you think happened losing that kind of money per patient when Elrod retired? Um, I, it was three weeks I was given before I was brought in by the new admin and said, you're going to change the way you do things or you're not going to continue. And for me personally, I needed to probably make a move out of Shreveport because my parents needed to come live with me and they just weren't interested in that. So I chose to, to shut it down, but that is exactly the problem. I ran a very patient friendly clinic and at the end of the day, it was closed uh, in no uncertain terms in large part because of the money. So it, it is definitely an issue, but you know, a lot of these younger surgeons too, why I'm in education, why I raise awareness, they might've been told, oh, by a mentor or by the company or whatever, not the companies are bad, but they might've been told, oh, well, you wanna do it this way for wound healing. And, and they're not malicious, they really believe that. you know. And to be fair, there can be some truth. There's never one right black and white answer, right? It's always areas of gray. Are there true clinical benefits to sometimes staging the different pieces? Sometimes, it depends on the patient. Are there also heavy financial incentives to do DBS a certain way? Yes. <laughs> um, and you can take your business somewhere else. So, you know, I think it's just important for patients to realize that you do have options. You do have the right to at least discuss it with the surgeon um, and the neurologist. But, you know, I will also say that the doctors, despite what you might think, doctors are not in charge in the American healthcare system. Um, administration is. So it might be that a doctor might be like, oh yeah, sure, I'd love to do that to you, for you, but you know, CEO Bob or whatever is telling me that we don't do that here, sorry. So it, it's the doctors in general, I tell people this a lot as I'm like disrupting the industry, doctors are generally good people. Um, the people that I went to medical school with, all very decent people. Doctors in general are not your problem. Now they might not listen and they might be exhausted because they're burned out and they're not sleeping and the system is totally getting rich off their backs, but they're still at heart good people. Give them a benefit because I can tell you having stepped away from myself for a year of sabbatical, looking back just how toxic it is of an environment to be a doctor while trying to help a patient with a major problem in a system that is so financially motivated. Uh, it is a exhausting effort. So kudos to your doctors that are out there trying their best, but understand that they may not have the final say. But, you know, listen, let's say you guys tell some other people who tell some other people, and all of a sudden, like 50 people are coming to the hospital saying, hey, I want this to change. That's how change happens, right? It's just people knowing more and requesting more. So on that super <laughs> positive note, blowing your mind here. You thought it was just going to be about DBS. And that, that is, again, if you're interested, 
Um, you know, I personally was going to draft a letter uh, to the gentleman. Uh, please do contact me. You know, if you feel like you have connection with um, organizations or you want to be a part of kind of a, a little grassroots, my personal grassroots effort to say, hey, for the patient, I think we need to update our coding. Uh, please feel free to contact me. And uh, it's just my last name, uh, WildenMD at Gmail, or you can find me on Facebook, Dr. Jessica Wilden. So this is a video of a patient of mine, and he is a, he's one of the young men, young-ish, that were part of the forestry industry. I'm a family man to start with. I love God. Try to be a good Christian, but fail miserably sometimes. The biggest thing about me is I like helping people. You know, I always have. I'm Richard Bowman. I'm 48 years old. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when I was 46 years old back in 2019. I had my sleep DBS surgery in January 2021, and uh, it's really improved my life. I've been married to Richard for 29 years. We've been together for 30 years. Richard, he was always the one that when somebody needed something, they called him. If your car broke down on the side of the road, you, we called him. Before Parkinson's, my life was uh, pleasant and wonderful. Like I said, I enjoyed helping people. I, I did lots of things, um, built lots of stuff, uh, enjoyed life. Around 2013 is when I first started knowing, noticing that I had problems. Uh, had, uh, I kept carrying my arm real stiff, like it was in a sling. I had gait issues. It's, couldn't walk right, kept dragging my right foot. I knew something was wrong. We thought it was back, you know, because I had back pain, so we thought it was just a nerve or something pinched. We ruled out stroke, because that's one of the first things we want to look at. So we ruled that out. You know, I was going to have back surgery more than likely. And uh, turns out it wasn't the case. One of the first places I went to was a neurologist in Texarkana. He said, he looks at me and he says, I think you got Parkinson's. And so he, he says, uh, my nurse will give you some literature on it. And it says on Wikipedia, it says, most Parkinson patients have a lifespan expectancy of five to 14 years after diagnosis. I'm 41 years old. So yes, we ran from that diagnosis hard and fast. And uh, so, Fast forward to Dr. Harris. She watched me walk. She tells me I have Parkinson's. And of course, I'm thinking about death, you know? And uh, she's, she's sitting in front of me. She, she sees that I'm upset. She puts her, places her hand on my knee and she says, Richard, she said, it's not a death sentence. She said, with the right medicine, we can, can help control you and make your life better. And she says, we even have brain surgery that we can do, DBS brain surgery. After Parkinson's, everything started declining. He lost himself. He lost everything about who he was. We lost him. Parkinson's in the eye of a caregiver is one of those things that's so hard to take. It takes away your life. And not just your physical life. It takes away your mental life and your, your emotional life. My life was pretty miserable most of the time uh, when my medicine was working. It was pretty well great, you know? But that was for about two hours at a time. And that was about four times a day that I felt great. The rest of the time, I was miserable. My medicine would burn off. I would feel like I had real high fever. I just wanted to put my head down in, in my hands. And uh, so we did the medicine. About a year later, you know, she would kept up in my dosage, up in my dosage, you know, how many pills would take a, a day. And a year later, I go back to see her, and she says, when she asked me, she said, have you thought about the DBS surgery? Parkinson's is part of my language, but it's hell. It really is. And uh, so we went to meet Dr. Wilder, and we finally got to meet her. And well, she's phenomenal, very good doctor. So she tells me about this, about the surgery, tells me about the DBS stimulator, and asks me what I think. 
<laughs> and I told her, I told her, I told her I said, if you think it'll help me, I'm ready right now. Richard was a very interesting case because he was late in being diagnosed with Parkinson's. He was diagnosed instead with arthritis and chronic pain and was really kind of bounced around. Nobody really understood what was going on with him. He was started on medicine and it worked like a lot of patients. It worked for a time, but he also was having to escalate his medicine use. He was developing wearing off and he also had untreated body pain in Parkinson's that he just felt like even with the medicine, his global mobility was not where he wanted it to be. So those things, wearing off of medicine, dyskinesia as a side effect of medicine, and having side effects from medicine, all those are indications for deep brain stimulation. So Richard really became a good candidate right away when I met him because he was already on the maximum dose of tolerated medicine with residual immobility that was untreated. Yeah, I, seen, I, I met with her in uh, December the 23rd of 2020. In January 20th of 2021, I was having surgery. It was uh, actually probably that night of the surgery when we went for our walk. Because uh, I had my gait back, I had my strut back, you know? Right then, I knew we were on the right track. Dr. Wilden comes in the next morning and she says, um, Well, what do you think? And we look at her, both of us look at her and say, what's going on? She says, we, you know, we don't have the second surgery done yet and, and he's already improving. And she looks and grin real big and she says, laughs. She says, that's what we call the honeymoon effect. Richard also had a wonderful honeymoon effect. Um, what struck me so much about him was the first day after surgery, he was like, almost in tears because he's like, I cannot believe how much my pain has improved. He was so amazed at how much better he felt. And his wife too was very moved by it. She said, you know, I have been underestimating his pain for a long time. Now everything is returning. He's walking right, he's holding his arm right, he's riding again, he's getting his physical traits back that he had lost before. And the difference from then to now is that then he was a person that kind of wanted to just hide in a corner. Now he's the person that wants to be in the middle of the room. The surgery has given me my life back and would I do it again? Yes, I would. That's not to say that deep brain stimulation is better or worse than medicine. We simply don't have a cure, so the more tools we can add to a family's ability to cope, the better. Well, you need to find a good doctor, a good surgeon, which I, I, got, I was fortunate enough to find. Have an open mind. Have an open mind and know that there's people there to help you. The surgery is to help you. So I definitely tell all families, if you are a candidate for deep brain stimulation, please consider it because it is simply another tool. Seeing him now, when he heads out that door and he goes down to the shop and he works on his truck or somebody else's, or when he's out in the pasture on his tractor or whatever he's doing, it's worth it. After the surgery, I would say, she, hopefully she'll say that she enjoys being around me most of the time. So, and she'll always, she, she has this little saying that she tells everybody that, she may not always like me, but she always, always love me. It's a good example of, you know, I like how we talk about cure for Parkinson's, but the reality is if someone like Richard had been provided personal protective equipment in the forestry industry, he probably wouldn't have Parkinson's. So, you know, it's important to always think about prevention too, uh, and not just cure because 
we don't really have a way to widely screen for if you're predisposed to Parkinson's, but an easy surrogate measure would be, does someone in your family or extended family have it? And if that's the case, then you really want to probably avoid pesticides, certain professions, dry cleaning, uh, because we know that that combination can be not good. So let's just open it up to questions about DBS, about ClearPoint imaging. I mean, pretty much I, my experience in the DBS realm is pretty broad. So I'm happy to basically answer anything else that, uh, or really Parkinson's. I mean, I did do medical management for many years as well. So if you have any other, uh, any other questions about the disease or about different options, please fire away. Somehow I had the impression that DBS was more effective on motor symptoms and not so effective on non-motor symptoms. Yeah, great, uh, great question. So I'm not going to sugarcoat things here because I have dealt with the entire spectrum. I am a surgeon, but more importantly, I was a Parkinson's doctor. You're exactly right. Things that DBS is good for, and there are other things that DBS did not work for. And you want to be very clear about what you're trying to treat. So one of the big things that I would see in my patients personally was that autonomic symptoms, your blood pressure not being stable, um, dizziness, bowel and bladder problems, a huge source of difficulty with daily life, right? Those things will generally not improve with brain surgery right now, I should say, um, because they are a problem with the brain communicating with the peripheral nerves of the autonomic system, which is different from the motor system. So you just need to know what it is you're trying to treat. Now, that being said, right, everything is a big picture. Let's say you're like, man, what really bothers me is I urinate at night like 15 times. And we would say, well, DBS isn't really going to help with that, but maybe DBS helps you move quicker, right? And fall less. So in that sense, could your quality of life get better with DBS, even though the symptom is autonomic or bowel or bladder in nature? Sure. So you just have to, the most important thing you have to have when you're considering DBS is a great relationship with one of your doctors. because. There's a, it's a big unknown, right? We say, oh yeah, we get it. We don't get it, all right? I love Vince, but like way too simple, okay? DBS is complicated. It is very complicated. Medicine is complicated. The disease of Parkinson's also pretty complicated and not cookie cutter. You just will run into things that you're not quite sure why they're happening. And you just have to have a good relationship with your provider to try and work through what's going on and what the best therapy is. Are there certain uh, physical therapy health assistance that can be done along with DBS to make uh, improvements in the patient? Yeah, so I love what you're touching on here because this is an important one. <laughs> DBS's success is in part due to us, right? Due to the surgeon, we don't wanna screw it up, wanna be in the right place at the right structure. But the other major determinant of how you're gonna do with surgery is you. What have you done to optimize your brain's health before we operate? So physical therapy, having a regular regimen, maybe doing physical therapy once a month or involved in the rock study or whatever it might be, you want to do, get your brain as good as it can be in terms of health. So like Ben said, those are basic things, right? Stay hydrated, eat well, keep your weight down. Um, you know, exercise, I cannot, okay? How many people exercise before they came here today? Yeah, all right, what, what? <laughs> there is nothing out there like exercise to help your brain get better. Do not ask me to explain that, okay? We just know that the more you walk on the planet Earth, the better your brain is. And that has been shown over and over and over. And if your balance sucks and you can't walk, do that little thing in a chair where you're moving your legs and fooling your brain into thinking that you're walking. The more steps you can take a day at the faster speed, 
has been associated with all sorts of health benefits for both people without Parkinson's and people with Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative diseases. So if you come to me and say like, hey, I want DBS, but I'm not exercising. It's a recipe for disaster, right? Because your expectations are such that I'm gonna be a quick fix for you. And it does not work like that. DBS does not work like that. Medicine does not work like that. Who do you think does best with medicine and with surgery? People who are already trying their best to take care of themselves. And I mean, it's, it's a tough truth to swallow, right? Especially in our society, which doesn't necessarily encourage personal responsibility. I'm sure you guys all feel that looking at younger people. But at the end of the day, you are the most important determinant about how successful your therapies are be, will be. The better your brain is at baseline, the better your medicine will work, the better surgery will work. So from a physical therapy standpoint, there was just a great article that came out that if you were doing physical therapy, like 12 sessions, instead of doing it twice a week for six weeks, do it once every other week for six months and the benefits tend to be sustained. So it's called pulsed physical therapy instead of burst physical therapy. And so that's kind of the way we should be moving in terms of how we are using PT along the course of the disease. And I recommend it obviously before surgery and definitely after surgery. And you know, no worries if you haven't, maybe this is news to you. You're like, well, I wasn't trying to ask for a quick fix. I just, I just didn't realize there was stuff I could do to up my brain game. And there is, right? That's good news ultimately is that it's in your court. You know, you take responsibility for making sure you get as many steps in every day as you can to work with a physical therapist every, you know, six months or so to try and keep a regular schedule. Believe it or not, brain health is exceedingly tied in to sleeping well at night and being awake during the day, right? What do we see when people are starting to deteriorate? their sleep-wake cycle gets all messed up, right? If we know anyone with Alzheimer's or whatnot. So keeping a regular schedule, going to bed on time. Um, I know I'm, I'm kind of in like the heart of Margaritaville here. So this is gonna sound like heresy, but avoiding alcohol. We know that alcohol is largely not great for the brain. And if you've already got a brain problem, you know, probably should, should largely kick it. Now, that being said, a little bit in moderation is okay. You know, everything in moderation, a little me, cake, okay? I love me some cake. I saw the bread back there. I was like, yeah, looking good. So it's not that sweets or alcohol are bad per se. It just, you wanna do it in a lot of moderation so that it's not a major regular thing. Yeah. Oh, somebody have a question? I'm doing physical therapy three times a week with a therapist. But what you're telling me is I do it once every six months. No, once. So let's. So met. So what? What the article that just came out said was that most Medicare will cover like twelve sessions or something like this. Yeah, self pay. So it, for you, it doesn't really matter. But like, let's say for Medicare, it would say twelve sessions. And what the article found was that when we did it very frequent. In short, you know, that, that it wasn't necessarily as good as when you spaced it out over a longer period. Now, that's under the assumption that you simply can't get it paid for more often. Now, if you are able to pay for it and do a lot of it, like indefinitely, then I think that's a fine option. <laughs> I think the article was operating under the assumption that typically a Medicare patient will only get 12 sessions. So if you only get that, what is the best use of that? And it's probably not twice a week for six weeks. It's probably once every other week for six months. So what you're doing is fine. More activity is always better. It's just for a lot of people, the payment and the access can be an issue. Do you still have to be on the regimen of the medication also, or can you back off the medication? Yeah, highly complicated question there. Again, best answer is have a good relationship with your provider before you make the plunge. In many people, when you put a brain pacemaker in, you can come off some of the medicine because the way I describe medicine and surgery is that Parkinson's is sort of like being consciously trapped in a box, right? You're like, imagine you're like locked in a little box, like one of the old mimes used to be. 
and you're awake, but you're locked in this box. Your mind is telling you to move, but you can't move. And then I were to say to you, you're locked in a box. Do you want a crowbar or a hammer or do you want both, right? Everybody say, I want both, right? <laughs> like, give me all the tools I can to get out of the darn box. That's medicine and surgery, okay? Medicine and surgery are just both tools because we don't currently have a cure. They are both tools to help you move as much as possible. For some people after surgery, they're gonna feel good on all of their medicine plus surgery. Okay, great, go nuts. And other people, they're gonna find after surgery, especially in certain targets, that they just don't feel like they might take their medicine in the morning and then they may not need it the rest of the day because the stimulator is doing more of the heavy lifting in terms of correcting the brain rhythm. And that's an important point to realize is that medicine also corrects the bad brain rhythm. That's the mechanism of treatment for Parkinson's is that we are correcting a bad brain rhythm. So basically, um, medicine and surgery work in tandem, although you can often use less. Yes, yes. Now, some people may need less of it, and that's a good thing. Like in my area, one of the concerns was cost of medicine. In many cases, Medicare would pay for surgery, but it would not pay as well for medicine. And so if people could replace some of their medicine with surgery, good, right? Because that helps their month to month financial situation. And that was a pretty common thing that we saw in my region as well, because some of the newer medicines like Rotari and things like this can be very, very expensive. Uh, so if money is an issue, sometimes reducing the medicine is good, you know, in that regard too. So a lot of people can reduce the medicine, but not everyone. And you shouldn't consider it a failure if you feel best with all your medicine, with surgery, and you feel even better, like congratulations, you know? So it's, I always tell people it's very individualized and that, that's why it's so important to have a good doc that you can talk through things with because everyone will be different, right? I'm sure as you guys, if I asked every single one of you what your experience with Parkinson's was, you would all have a slightly different answer. And I think, uh, and that's true for your response to the therapy. Yeah, sure. Okay. Now I know so far, I don't know what they have it now. Mm -hmm. Do you have a way to test whether your medication is up to the therapeutic? <laughs> yeah, another great question. Um, a lot of, so right now they just go off how you're feeling. Right. I don't. Yeah. Like, and, and right, right, right. So that's a, that is a super complicated question, but it gets, it does touch on why I, I liked surgery personally. And not just because I was a surgeon, like I, I genuinely liked it as like a doctor as a treatment option. Surgery tended to be because it was a pacemaker. It tended to be very steady as a therapy medication, which I also prescribed and really liked. Um, it was much more unpredictable. And that's because the way your body absorbs it on any given day is different, right? What you eat, I mean, you guys probably all know that, like what you eat, your emotional state, you, whether you fast, like there are so many questions day to day about the absorption of the medicine that it can be really erratic. And as a tool, sometimes, Sometimes, especially as the disease advanced, I found medicine to be a very erratic, difficult to control tool. There wasn't a quick skin test or blood test where we could be like, yep, it's going to work good for you today. <laughs> You're at level 10. It wasn't like that, right? You might take the same exact amount that worked great for you yesterday, and it's a disaster today. And that has to do with both your absorption and also the fact that medicine's interaction with the brain is more labile than surgery in my opinion. That, that the pacemaker was just kind of, it had a steady interaction. Sometimes you'd feel like your DBS changed even if it didn't change, but most of the time it was a pretty steady effect. Medicine on the other hand, patients would be like, some days it's fantastic and other days it's disastrous. And that, so that interaction between the brain and medicine, I found to be a little unreliable um, and that's why I liked surgery as a stabilizing tool in addition to a little bit of medicine, you know. Um, but as it stands right now, I like the idea of saying, 
you could take a little blood test or a little skin swipe and, and it would tell you how much medicine you needed that particular day. But right now we, the tech is not there to really have that kind of predictive value for how you should use medicine each day. Uh, and it is a very difficult question. Again, uh, a very complicated interaction between the brain and most medicines. I was thinking of the eventually we will get double incontinence. So if the mm -hmm. DDS, mm -hmm. would that improve that problem? Incontinence? Yeah, yeah good question. Um, it depends. It depends. The general answer would be no. That's more, it's more for gross motor movements like stiffness, slowness, tremor, general core mobility. That being said, you always have to look at the bigger picture. If you were moving better, would the incontinence be better from a lifestyle standpoint? And that's where I would see some patients, their lifestyle would get better in some of those aspects after DBS, not necessarily because of a direct effect on incontinence, but because they were moving better and were better able to deal with some of those problems. All right, we covered a lot. Call me when you wanna bust a Washington. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just the, the big one was that there was all this big deal made about access, but very little discussion of how DVS is paid. And I'm like, listen, man, you want to increase access, you got to make it easier for people. And we can't be in a situation where the coding is in direct opposition to what is easiest for patients. <laughs> So, I, I mean, obviously it's, it's a bit controversial for sure. And I would like to, again, reemphasize that uh, these comments are on my own as Dr. Jessica Wilden, um, based on my experience in rural America and Main Street, uh, not Wall Street, but um, they are not the position of ClearPoint or Boston Scientific. But I think it is important that patients know about that, you know, and, and one of the big things is, you know, for instance, how do we reach more minorities? Well, the problem is, right, if you're, you know, maybe a minority and you don't have a car or you can't afford gas, like dealing with the financial logistics is not some small non-intellectual thing. It's the real problem for people. I literally can't get there to get my stimulator. So I think when they talk about trying to outreach to more rural areas, to more Latina, to more, you know, African American population, you need to understand that in those populations, it might not just be cultural, it might just be logistical, you know, that I don't have a car, I'm going to have to take a bus to get my DBS, and if it's four different surgeries, I can't do it. So, um, but yeah, it, I encourage you to, you know, definitely reach out and read the bill um, to some extent, read the WHO statement that was put out about the world impact of Parkinson's. Um, some really great stuff in there, but I, I just found it a little bit, um, I didn't see a lot of mention, <laughs> not for, of course, WHO, because that's a world statement, but for, you know, the United States, I think it's very important that we understand how the coding is for DBS, because it does impact the accessibility to you and the convenience. And I think it's important for those of us who are Parkinson's to understand that uh, what speaks to politicians is voting power. Yeah, exactly. As people with Parkinson's tend to be older, and tend to be voters. Yeah. A couple of really good websites, PD and Vendors, take on the World Health Organization. We need to start taking a much more proactive role of the government. Absolutely. Yeah, this is a very visible disease. You have a lot of power, I will tell you. Um, so through your organizations, um, you know, one of my goals having taken a sabbatical year basically was to understand what the system's issues were in terms of barrier to care and really understand why things were being done a certain way. You know, I think for a lot of us in medical training, we get very myopic and we only look at things like the treatment itself and not the bigger picture of why the treatment has done certain ways. And it's been a very enlightening year for me to realize that there are some big systems barriers behind patients not getting what I would consider the best care they 
could. And those are absolutely things you can press your politicians on and be like, are you going to work to change this coding? Are you going to work so that as we move toward, for instance, Medicare is looking at value based care now, right? Rewarding a hospital or a doctor for providing the most convenient, most efficient, most valuable treatment. Well, this is an area that would excel with that kind of pay payment model, right? Fee for service just encourages you to have more services for more fees. Value-based care would say instead, you know what, if your neurologist and your surgeon are in the same office, we're gonna give you more for that because it's more convenient. If you put the whole device in, in one setting, we are gonna give you more for that because it is more better, it is better for the patient. Like those kind of value-based care reimbursement would be very powerful, I think, for Parkinson's. And so, you know, that's something you can ask. You have a town hall or a politician, you can ask, are, are you in favor of moving toward value-based care for Parkinson's? And, you know, if they're deer in the headlights, then take the time to explain it to them, you know, or refer them to my email. And, uh, and it's that kind of movement that, you know, we, but, but, there is a global movement in Center for Medicare and Medicaid to move in that direction. So now is a good time to start bringing it up because the idea of getting rid of fee for service and moving toward more value based care where you are reimbursed by making patient better, that is a movement that has been gaining over three years. You know, this is not a technique that is difficult for me to teach somebody. Um, it's actually fairly straightforward compared to a lot of brain surgery, believe it or not. So, you know, there's no reason why it shouldn't be offered in a community.